Hi again, welcome back. Dr. Lee Coleman here, and if you caught the last session, you know that I introduced uh, what was a new area of my work started in 1985 when I first began to become aware of uh, the pro processes that were being used to hopefully investigate an allegation that a child, one or more children, depending on the case, had been sexually abused. And uh, that was a subject that I had not been working in as far as the law is concerned before that. And I explained how that came about, that I began to get into that arena. And I explained that it wasn't any choice of mine. It was that I began to get calls from attorneys who were caught up in those kind of cases. And this time, I want to now follow through on my promise from last time to explain a little more of what they were doing in these kind of cases and go on to explain where it comes from. And in order to do that, I think maybe the most compelling way is to start with a particular case, and it's a notorious case, the McMartin Preschool case. And once we've explored that, I hope that it'll become pretty clear just how wrong it was. But most important of all, just to give you the punchline at the beginning, is what we're going to see is the people who created this terrible injustice were not just ordinary social workers or district attorneys. They were leaders in a new movement aimed at protecting children from sexual abuse. Now, who of us would want to object to a new movement which would give greater protection to children from sexual abuse? Certainly not me, and I hope not you. But the point is going to be, that's not what they created. They created a system which will not only find guilty people guilty, but can easily and regularly find innocent people guilty and send them away for decades and sometimes the rest of their life and terribly injured children by teaching them to believe things happened which didn't happen. And that's the McMartin preschool case. So to put it another way, we're not only going to learn by my description of the McMartin case, the terrible methods that were used, but we're going to learn where the methods came from that are being used today. Because I went on from working on that case and other cases, to doing those cases for the next 30 years. I've only in the last few months stopped doing those kind of cases with regard to studying and possibly testifying in court. So hundreds of cases that I've testified in, thousands of cases that I've reviewed but not had to go to court on, I have a very wide-based experience with how the system, the criminal justice system, is handling these kind of cases. And it's the most sustained form of injustice of all the kinds of injustice I've been describing that come from how psychiatry is used by our society. This is the worst example that I've ever seen. So I hope you really pay attention and Get in, get in with me on this subject to the best degree that you can. Hello again, Dr. Lee Coleman here. And as promised last time, I'm going to talk about the McMartin preschool case um, that those of you old enough may remember, but many of you will not remember. It was in the summer of 1985 that I was called by an attorney representing one of the seven defendants who were employees at the McMartin Preschool in Manhattan Beach, California, a suburb of Los Angeles. Uh, you may recall that I had only about six months before first been introduced to the subject of how investigations of alleged child sexual abuse were being conducted. And already by that time, I had been involved in quite a few cases and already begun to see a pattern which was very disturbing. 
namely a pattern in which once an allegation was entered because somebody in a child's life had a, a worry or a fear or an absolute strong belief that their child had been molested, had contacted law enforcement, and an investigation had been started. And I had already seen a pattern where the investigation was being conducted in a way which was assuming from the beginning that the child was a victim, and then doing things which seemed to be aimed at confirming what they were already assuming, as though the possibility that the accusation might not be true was just not entering their mind. That, that was what the pattern was coming about in what I had seen. So when I first got the call from this attorney, he asked me if I would be willing to study the case. Uh, and uh, we talked a little bit about the general area and, and what my experience had been. I learned that uh, if I were gonna be able to review any of the tape recordings that were done of the children, because this involved many, many children, not just one child, that I would need to travel to Los Angeles where the tapes were being kept in the prosecutor's office. So I agreed to do that. I agreed to study the case. And when I, was, when I received materials, which, have, which would be the police investigation materials, that would be the first thing, written police reports. The next thing was that there were written notes of uh, who had interviewed the children what the circumstances were and what they had uh, concluded. There were some medical records, especially on one child, uh, that I had a chance to study these medical records. So I, I began that study and very quickly I could see that there were some of the similar problems that I had seen in other cases. First, I saw that the police who began to investigate the allegations way back in 1983 had not found any evidence that any child had been molested. Talked to the children, talked to the parents, uh, and there was nothing to confirm the initial allegation which had been brought to the police in the first place. And as a result, the case had more or less died down. But I then learned also that when a particular district attorney uh, got involved, that a new series of interviews had been arranged by a, at a facility called the Children's Institute International. And I began to learn from some of the written records that that's when it was alleged that the children were beginning to say things which indicated that things had been done to them, improper things at the McMartin preschool. So that's when I made arrangements through the district, the defense attorney who had arranged for me to be hired by the court to go down to Los Angeles and look, start to look at some of the videotapes that were being done at the Children's Institute International. And it's when I first saw those tapes that I was really quite shocked and amazed at the methods that I saw, even though I had already been studying a number of cases and already knew that very leading and suggestive and biased questioning was going on, but truly shocked when I saw what a team of interviewers in which the leader was a social worker named Key McFarlane, and she had two other trainees with no real mental health background who she had trained to use her methods were interviewing the children. And I remember very clearly when I saw the very first interview, which I'll tell you about next time, I said to him, holy shit, look at that. And what I meant by that is that it was the most egregious form of manipulation of the child, the most unprofessional behavior that I could imagine. Come back next time and we will dig into the interview. We'll dig into the background of the very first child that was believed by his mother to be, have been molested. 
the unprofessional behavior of the UCLA Medical Center in over-interpreting medical examination findings, all of which is going to begin to give you an idea of just how misdirected the system was then. And when we finally get done with that, we're going to look a little further about who the people were who were doing it, who the professionals were, and where they had to come to form the opinions they had about how do you find out whether a child's been molested. Come back next time. I remember as though it were yesterday what I saw on that first tape. It was an interview that had been done on November the 1st, 1983. I was watching the tapes in the summer of 1985. The case had not yet come to trial. And it was a four-year-old child who had recently been a member, or, I mean, a student at the McMartin Preschool. And she was one of the children that had been interviewed because of a suspicion that I will tell you about how that generated in a second, might have been sexually molested at the McMartin Preschool. There were dozens and dozens of children who, no, who are now believed to be currently at the school that had been allegedly sexually molested, and many, many more dozens, several hundred in total, who were no longer at the McMartin School, were now nine and 10 years old, but were believed by the interviewers and the other people working with them to have been victims. This four-year-old, at one point in the interview with Key McFarlane, told her after a lot of prodding that we know that things have happened at the school and the older kids have told us what happened. So if you have a good memory, you, sh you should be able to tell us. All this was statements made to the child, despite the fact that there were no other children who had said anything happened, except those children who'd been badgered and coerced into saying something. This child then said, well, my mommy told me that they were tying up kids. Now, of course, the mother wouldn't know whether anything had happened at the school. She could only have heard something from somebody else. So the child was obviously repeating something she had heard that was completely unreliable. The interview was to tap into the child's memory of whether anything had happened. So when the child said, my mommy told me they were tying up kids, of course, a responsible professional interviewer would have explained to the child in four-year-old terms that we only want to talk about things that you know, not things that anybody else has told you. Or they might have said, well, tell me more about when mommy told you to try to learn a little bit about the circumstances of who had been talking to the child. But instead of doing any of those common sense things, here's what Kim McFarland did. She said, okay, well, I have some rope and some little toy chairs. Why don't you show me how they tied up the children at the school? And that's when I said, holy shit, look at that. How in the world could you justify to begin a process of training that child to have a memory of such events? If that is not child abuse, I'd like to know what it is. Of course it's child abuse. Any professional should know that human memory is such that if you begin to repeat statements about something for whatever reason, in this case by being trained to say it, that can easily become part of your memory and you can now believe something for the rest of your life. But nonetheless, that's what happened. This little four-year-old child was asked to tie up dolls to a chair to demonstrate what mommy told her had happened at the school. Well, if I tried to go into many other examples, we'd be here longer than I think we can be together. So suffice it to say, that example was not the only one. I saw example after example after example in the total of 60 hours of videotapes that I watched to prepare for my testimony in the McMartin trial. 60 hours of interviews in, on approximately 50 or 60 children 
ranging from four years old all the way up to 10 years old because some of the children were not current students at the school, but they were elementary school students somewhere else. But throughout, there was this relentless training and badgering and rewarding of children who would make statements of the most fantastic abuse that was imaginable, things that could never have physically happened, that were impossible events, children supposedly being taken air on airplanes to fly away to uh, places in the country to undergo group sex and then brought back and all kinds of things being done and yet no parent would ever notice that anything was wrong, etc. So that's how the children came to say anything happened. There was never one minute of one tape that I ever watched, which was a child spontaneously talking about something that had not come in the immediate face of an adult badgering them and coercing them and sweet talking them and lying to them about what supposedly other people had said in order to get them to say it.